Hi everyone. It's my real pleasure to open the first ever the word time um, offline discussion and presentation at the Kiev School of Economics. We're a little bit shy today, so we kind of said 10 people, but I think there are like 30 here, everyone together. And remember, if uh, there is a siren, we'll have to go downstairs because the end. We have our esteemed guest, and we don't want any uh, bad publicity afterwards. We want more lectures yeah, to happen. We, we want good publicity. Yeah, but I think I think the guest should survive. That would be. Uh, I, mean, I, I you know. Violence, violence. I I think it will be fine. It just uh, the probability of something happening is here. Um, you know, you can calculate it. It's it's probably smaller than you would get hit by a car I in see. Europe. Uh, but uh, still, we don't want to uh have any misperception right so but i think uh we have to work through the war i think it's important to do that because academia and uh, culture and art are the fabric of the society and the war tends to radicalize people and we want to maintain the democracy the vibrant democracy that we are that we are protecting that we are fighting for and therefore we have to continue to do what we are have always been doing. I think it's much more important than sometimes we tend to realize. So I hope it's just, you know, the beginning of many, many events. In fact, I, I would like to have a uh, fancy, in terms of intellectual input, uh, conference on economics in Ukraine at the Kiev School of Economics as soon as possible, maybe May, maybe June, uh, to bring top intellectual leaders of the world to Kiev and discuss uh, what needs to be done now and what needs to be done in the future and what can be done. And uh, Luis, it's been a pleasure uh, interacting with you in real life and also yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Thank you very much for being such a good friend of uh, Ukraine. You are in, you know, in the EU in politics now, but you are a fantastic scholar. So I can relate, I'm not, such a fantastic scholar as you, but I try, you know, I also was in, in politics a little bit, but you're longer. So, so I think uh, I, I, I can relate to your career. And so it's particularly uh, precious and valuable for me to, uh, that you are the first speaker, because it shows something that academia can do in real world, not only uh, think about and understand the world, but also change the world. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. It's it's so wonderful to be here with all of you. And uh, I mean, first of all, I would have said that I was very impressed by by the Kiev School of Economics, even if this wasn't happening in the middle of a war. Uh, I think what you're doing here, uh, all the fundraising, the building, the scholarship, the policy work, everything you're doing is is, is really very impressive. But if on top of that, you, you have that you're managing to stay open and to have seminar series and to do the policy work uh, when all of this is happening around you is, is, is really incredible. Many of us are very inspired by you. You know, we, we you know, in, in Europe, people tend to take uh, freedoms for granted and people in the European Union, people tend to, you know, be just discussing uh, about the price of oranges and the common agricultural policy and all that, you know, and, you know, the European Union largely is an institution that is designed to transform quarrels about borders into quarrels about the price of oranges, right? We, we don't fight about uh, who, where is your border? We fight into five o'clock in the morning to try to decide the quotas or etc. cetera. And, and now, we see what's happening here and we remember why Europe exists. It exists because we're looking for peace. We are trying to, to, to have a peaceful continent. And um, when, when I saw and when many of us saw what, what, what was about to happen and what was happening to Ukraine, we made it our mission to, to do our little or our best effort to help you. And for me, everything I can do, and I can tell you, each one of you, I will do it, okay? So I, this is my second visit here. And, and, and uh, I, every time I'm more impressed with the Ukrainian people, with what you're doing and what you work, so, so count on me. And what I wanted to do today is to talk about, um, to talk about uh, sanctions and to talk about financial policy. So we have 
among the public. Some of some of you are, are are some of the biggest experts on sanctions here, and and some of you come from the from the banking community and, and can talk about about the other half. So there are two halves here. There's going to be a liquidity. Uh, what about uh, the budget and how do we fund this? And uh, what about the sanctions and how do we really get this going? And 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 the basic claim is going to be that if you think about the balance now, you know these games that kids play with the balance up and down. Um, the way Europe is tilting the balance now is really more for Putin than for Ukraine. We are putting a lot of money into buying energy, gas, and oil for uh, from Putin. We are putting less money to help Ukraine. Uh, fight the war and what I would like to do is to change the balance that uh, on the on the financing needs side we help Ukraine much more on the sanctions uh, side we really help Putin much much less that's really the big frustration the big anger that some of us feel and I've put you some of you have seen uh, a lot of effort into that it's not to say that we haven't done anything um, uh, if you think about the, the Russia balance We've, ban we've put the, industry, the individual sanctions, we put these financial measures, the SWIFT uh, banning seven institutions and then some, some, some more in the last package, transportation, energy, defense, the military technology bans on goods and media, on diplomacy. There have been a lot of efforts with, with, with Russia, many of them unprecedented. So I don't want to say we didn't do anything. And we also have helped Ukraine. There are some, uh, there's a macrofinance program, there's a uh, fundraising campaign that the, the president of the commission did, a humanitarian aid package, a civil protection mechanism, the peace facility, the temporary protection mechanism, all of those things are non-trivial. I don't want to say they're trivial, but it's clear that they are not enough. And this is my way to show you that they are not enough. Uh, we have uh, the, the um, I don't know if this thing works. Do you, do you see it? Do you see a little red dot? Mm, I don't really see it. Huh? Ah, because of the type of screen. All right, perfect. So, I mean, on the Russia side of the balance, you see what what uh, what has happened. We thought with the first package on on that Sunday of the first Sunday of the war, that must have been the 27th or 28th. Uh, we thought we were going to really hit the financial system of Russia and create a bank panic. And there was a moment when it looked like there was going to be a bank panic, but then. It, it started to be like, well, we're going to continue using the Red Bank and using uh, the, the biggest banks, Gazprom Bank, to pay energy. They're going to be getting a lot of money, hard currency, and that's going to be enough. And indeed, the rubble has basically gone back to its pre-war value. On the other hand, if you look at Ukraine, clearly we're not doing enough. I mean, okay, in a war, it's, it's to be expected that your GDP drops, but it's really going to, going to crumble. And of course, any economist looking at this is thinking hyperinflation, right? You're not thinking hyperinflation there, but you're thinking hyperinflation there. If we don't put the money here that is needed, then the central bank ends up having to print this money and then we end up, um, well, we know where we end up. We end up with a, with a financial system that is not viable and with an economy that is not viable. So as I told you, I, I divide this talk into two halves. One is how do we balance away from uh, stop financing uh, Putin uh, by moving forward with the sanctions. And I, I, I will have some concrete su suggestions to discuss. And how do we get some money to Ukraine uh, immediately? And I will also have some suggestions. On both of these things, we'll have a dialogue at the end. I very much want to listen to you and to hear you. I mean, we are writing things in op-eds in Europe and writing resolutions in the parliament and pushing things forward. And of course, your input is absolutely invaluable for that. Um, so let me just go to the first question. How are we going to stop financing Putin? This is how much money uh, we have spent into uh, this war uh, in, the, in the size of, of, of Putin. I don't have those synchronized, so I forgot to pass both, sorry. Um, so um, 37 billion is what we sent, uh, 12 billion in uh, in oil, 24 billion in gas. This is the payments for, to Russia between the 24th of February and right now. Now, this is a huge discussion and it's starting to tear Europe apart and it's going to, to really tear Europe apart. It's going to be a huge 
huge controversy. Because basically, um, many of us claim uh, that uh, there is sufficient evidence that leads us to expect that there is no collapse of the European economy. This, if, if you stop gas. Uh, this is the uh, Council of Economic Experts documentation summarizing the different studies. The main one is the Bachmann et al., but there have been work by ECB, by Deutsche Bank Research, etc. And basically, if you look at it, you see that the amount of the GDP drop for Europe is two or three points in the worst case scenarios. Even if it was four, it seems manageable to me. Um, the main reason is that if you look at it just simply from engineering perspective, there are basic good substitutes. I mean, the whole discussion that you see is about the elasticity of substitution, right? What people wonder is how much um, is, is it going to be possible to replace that gas by other fuels, that oil by other fuels. And of course, the German government basically, which is talking about hunger, is basically saying these things you can't substitute. The truth of the matter is um, you can. You can substitute gas, as I'll show you, because a lot of it is using for energy production, but you can even substitute industrial uses because you can import the industrial uh, goods. Okay, then the industry is not producing. Well, we've done that with COVID. We've just subsidized the industry to stay closed. That was the hotel and the restaurant industry. So even in that case, it's not a disaster. But the point is there is actually a solution for most of them. Coal, there is a lot of spare capacity. Um, oil, this, we're talking about 3 million barrels per day of crude and 1 million barrels a day of oil products. There is enough in the OPEC right now. And gas, which is really the place where everybody is, is having a fight, is one where I think it can be uh, solved. So what can you do with gas? The big number for uh, uh, gas is 150 billion cubic meters of gas, which is imported by Europe from Russia a, a year. That's what we need to replace. It seems that um, two thirds, we are importing around one to two billion cubic meters of LNG per week right now. So if you're importing two billion cubic meters a week, if we continue to do that, we might replace of the 150, 100 just with LNG boats, okay? It's so maybe optimistic, but we are importing a lot. And basically there's a spare capacity, there is going to be an increasing floating LNG terminals, and basically what you need to do is to invest in reconfiguring the pipelines. So first thing, we can import LNG. That's, that's the best, the first substitute. Second thing, we have 32 billion cubic meters on storage. I told you 150 is what we need to replace. Uh, two thirds could be imported via LNG, that would be 100. You have 32 more potentially. But also the truth of the matter is that the governments are not doing enough. I want to give you two examples. The first one is the gas fields in Groningen. Groningen is the biggest gas field in Europe. It's 500 billion cubic meters uh, of, 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 of gas that is stored, and we're going to close it, okay? The plan is to close it. And the reason is that it has created some earthquakes and the citizens are worried. I want to tell you that uh, they are worried, okay? Uh, and it's going to be closed. You could, uh, the, you could import, uh, you could substitute the whole three, three years worth of, of Russian imports with this if you don't close it. But even if you, I mean, if you, if, you, if you think about it more realistic and you, and you think how many years worth of after the LNG, so there is 50 left, I told you, you could do 10 years of imports, okay? So look, this is how much it was producing. You see it was producing up to 90 billion cubic meters and it's been going down. So the average has been around 50, which is pretty good because that's what we need. And basically there's been a political decision to kill it, okay? You see that it's going away. So there's been these mini earthquakes and there's political pressure to close it. The truth of the matter is, uh, I mean, the Netherlands has no discussion of opening this back up, right? But if you actually calculate how much this is worth at current prices, um, what you discover is that 500 billion cubic meters are at, at the price of 100, which is uh, now a little bit the megawatt hour. By the way, one thing with, for those of you who do energy, which is extraordinarily bizarre with energy, 
is that you have to keep three metrics in mind all the time. You cannot just say, oh, I'm going to remember billion cubic meters and I will be done. It's not like that. You have to remember billion cubic meters, joules and kilowatt hours, and megawatts, and make all the conversions. So it's a bit complicated. But look, basically right now, the billion cubic meters translate into billion of euros. So that's pretty nice after you do all these complications. So there's 500 billion euros to compensate Dutch citizens who are concerned. It seems to me that if you go to the 500,000 inhabitants on Groningen and tell them, okay, I'll keep this open and I'll give you 1 million euros, I bet you they would vote yes in a referendum. That's my, that's my guess. But nobody's asking this, okay? This is not a question that's on the table. So second thing that Europe could do, um, look at this interesting comparison. Left, and we're talking about Germany, okay? And I said, Europe is not doing enough with gas, Netherlands, and now Europe is not doing enough with gas, Germany. So this is the natural gas of Germany. 40% comes from Russia, okay? Look how much of the gas is used in power. Around a little bit over 30% of gas is used in power. So what it seems is that if you were to not use gas in power generation, you wouldn't need to do anything to industry. They're saying, oh, gas is so important for industry. You have to shut down the chemical process. They're like, hey, this is mostly power. So all we need to do is to find other ways to produce power. There must be some other ways. Well, there are, there are. This is the gas uh, gross power produced in Germany in, te in terawatt hours. So this is now not a rate, but this is the stock how much was produced in total. And what you see is that there were 163 terawatt hours of coal. There were, uh, in the last year, there were 89 terawatt hours of natural gas and 69 of nuclear. Now, nuclear is gonna be shut down. This was in 21. There were six nuclear reactors. Three closed at the end of last year, 1.4, 1.3, 1.2. Three are closing this year. You must be thinking, wow, they're so worried about gas. They must be opening all these nuclear plants. <laughs> no, that's totally out of the table. Totally out of the table. Nobody is talking about starting this Brockdorf and Grunde and Grundemeyer or stopping the closure of those three. So if you actually do the numbers and you start thinking, okay, so how much, how many terawatt hours can I get with these nuclear plants? You basically figure out that with the three and three that are closed, you can already get eight terawatt hours. So if you just went down a couple of years, three years more, you will have enough to replace the um, entire nuclear production. And the calculations are there. I'll, I'll put it up in the website so you guys can, can do it. So that's the calculation. Assuming that the similar power needs us in 2021, half the 90 terawatt hours that natural gas provides, you could do with, with uh, LNG. The nuclear reactors could produce, uh, basically you do, you do the SAMs and to cut Russian imports, you need the three nuclear reactors that were just closed and four more. Now, I'm just using half of it from LNG, okay? So I'm saying LNG produces, so the solution is 60, 20, 20. 60 is non-Russian, 20 is LNG, ships and 20 is um, nuclear and you get it okay so now what does the german government say about this there is a report of the economics minister and those are the seven excuses or reasons they give to not doing this the first one is legal approvals the government says they have to change the law say hey you're the government man i mean of course just go just change the law second safety well, they've increased the safety ratio, so now to open these nuclear plants, they wouldn't be safe enough. Okay, do you prefer to be nuked by Putin or to have a one in a billion risk assessment? I mean, just move your safety re re record. Fuel, um, we would need some new fuel. Okay, spare parts, personnel, you can get the people who are retiring back into the work. Economic considerations, you need to grant them for, for three, five years. Okay, grant them for three or five years and energy replacement, you would need to keep using some coal and gas, they say, while you are starting this up. So it seems every, every argument to me seems like an excuse. And there has been a German, um, 
a German uh, uh, think tank who's actually done the calculation. The orange is Russian uh, gas. So these are the supplies of, of natural gas. It's basically the same numbers I was giving you before. And they have three supply assumptions, baseline, maximum, and realistic, and three demand scenarios. The, the baseline is um, 2022 uh, past consumption, maximum supply is no maintenance, so it's irrealistic, and realistic supply is uh, taking into account uh, the, neighbor, the neighboring countries. Then there are three demand models, um, which are the um, baseline, medium, and optimistic. Baseline is the one that has a little bit of savings, similar to a year, a few years back when there was some expensive gas. Here, there is twice as many savings, and here there are pretty large savings. Okay, so if you, com if you combine the supply and demand models here, what you see is that basically um, in the scenario, which is basically um, with a realistic supply, so look at realistic supply and medium savings, you actually, this German think tank thinks you basically are essentially there. You have a tiny gap that you cannot do. So they basically say um, they are not using all these other things that I'm putting in. They're just basically saying it can be done. So why, why can it not be done? Um, so tap more LNG API imports, increase pipeline imports, and reduce energy consumption. That's basically what, what is, what all that is needed. So that's my something my, 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 I don't know, frustration. We've been trying to say this for a long time. We've been telling people, we've been telling politicians, we wrote a resolution in parliament which says this, etc. but the governments are not there. Um, basically, it remains very, very controversial. So what can we do? So basically, uh, my main consideration here, and I don't want to go over time, so, uh, because I have two things to do. My main consideration here is, to go out of the all or nothing uh, logic. We have a silly logic now. Some people are saying, we can do gas. Other of us are saying, yes, you can do it. And then we are all stuck. So how do we get out of the simple all or, no not all or, all or nothing logic? The way we can get out of the simple or nothing uh, logic is by introducing a, a tariff. And I will say how. The point is the price to EU, EU buyers raises, what the suppliers get goes down to the extent that they are, they are uh, to some extent that they are elastic, they don't have other alternatives, and as a result, you can actually do much better, and I will show you why. This is a paper we just published in Vox EU. Vox EU, by the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, is running uh, with Dominic Runner and Beatrice Vedder and, and myself, Dimauro and myself, we're running a series on the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, the economic consequence of war, we're calling it, and we put more or less one or two articles every day. So there's a lot of good reading on economics. And John Soon from MIT, a student from MIT, uh, produced this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, analysis, uh, very, very clearly told. He basically says, look, suppose that uh, we have completely inelastic demand. We need the gas, we can't live without it. If you put a tariff, the Russians are, we need the same amount. So everything is the same. We pay a tariff. And um, since it's a tax that goes to the EU taxpayer, we recover it. There's no losses, no gains. That's the worst case scenario where we really need the gas. We pay more, we don't reduce consumption, too bad. But if you have any elasticity, then what happens is, so there is a, there is a supply curve and there is a demand curve. Consumers can adjust. What happens is, is the standard tariff analysis. What happens is you get, consumers are going to look, their demand is a little bit lower when the price goes up, it's logical, but the suppliers also are going to have to accept, apart from a lower quantity, a lower price. And that's less money for to putting. And I can move this curve wherever I want, okay? I can go to zero supply. I don't need to say no gas tomorrow. I just need to put a, a tariff on Putin's gas. Um, how do we design the tariff? The design of an optimal tariff is a, a very kind of, uh, it has, I was going to say very intuitive, but it has some counterintuitive things. It was something done in 1951 that has been improved now in recent analysis. The point is that 
a tariff is not going to matter on how much we need it. It's just going to matter on the elasticity of supply. So basically, here are the things that determine a tariff. And, and this is what I think is not so unintuitive. The higher the tariff is going to be higher when Russia has no alternatives but to sell it to us. Okay? Their supply is very inelastic. That's how we, we are going to explain it. So, first of all, um, how inelastic is the, is the Russian supply? Well, it's quite, actually, people say, well, they can always sell their oil or the gas somewhere else. Not so easy. Not so easy. On the gas, everybody understands, the Kansai pipe is not so easy to sell that Siberian gas comes through pipeline, Nord Stream 1 to Lubmin. It's not so easy to, to, to divert. But think about, um, about oil. So, uh, the EU and UK are, are, count, are big, big buyers, 63%. If you add US, Turkey, and Japan, who would presumably join, we basically have 80%. Can they so easily kind of find buyers for you are selling something and you have to find buyers for 80% of your merchandise, or are you going to lose a lot? Probably you're going to lose a lot. Okay. Second, Russia has pre-existing gas pipelines and oil pipelines that come straight into Europe. Third, um, there are uh, basically um, big gaps between the cost and the price, which means they're willing to accept a lower price. And finally, we already observed that they are accepting a big gap between the euro price and the oil. So it's actually clear that they can actually have to be stuck. How much more that gap could be? Maybe we can push that price much, much further down. So my point here is a tariff is actually um, desirable. And how far we need to go, it's actually only dependent on how much are we willing to inflict ourselves pain in order to inflict pain on them? But notice, all of this money, the difference with the tariff from other solutions being talked is that all of this money, the EU tariff revenue in the middle, is money that the taxpayer collects and gets back. So the European Union gets this, puts this tariff, gets the revenue, and can dig it back to the consumer. So it's not pure pain. You can actually get basically uh, consumers to be as well off. So that's my first point. Um, don't get stuck in the zero one discussion, gas ban, no gas ban. I mean, I am gas ban, I've been saying gas ban every time, but let's just start to at least hit them with the tariff and then we start moving forward. Um, the second thing I wanted to tell you about is, is, is money, is finance. Um, and the war, as you know, is having a tremendous cost. And there's been some interesting work. Uh, Timothy, in particular, has done some work on the, on the reconstruction. There's been a recent CPR, Vox EU volume. Um, so basically, big drop in production, big destruction of physical capital, and some big dis destruction of human capital. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. What I wanted to talk about is what Oleg Ustenko said in Reuters uh, this weekend. He also told me 10 days ago, and I mean, it's, it's pretty shocking. Um, Ukraine has running now a monthly deficit of 8 billion. How big is 8 billion? Well, the GDP was around 170, but it's supposed to drop by 40%. So maybe the GDP is 100. Suppose the GDP is 100. We're running 8% deficit per month. 8% GDP deficit per month. That's a lot, okay? That is a lot. Um, so the government says uh, we need to make up 50 billion to just be relaxed and be comfortable. So what I wanted to talk in this second part is I, I told you about tilting the balance in the opposite way. So we were tilting the balance towards Russia, now less because we put this tariff and we want to tilt it more towards Ukraine. How can we do it? Um, so this is what we are doing right now. Um, we said we bought 37 billion worth of gas from Putin, and we've given 24 billion in total, 22 billion, sorry, in total to Ukraine, counting bilateral aid on the left and non-bilateral aid on the right, 12.9 plus nine. That's the total amount. These are figures from this week. Okay, these are these are the Kiel Institute figures that came up uh, just now. So. Um, the gap is going to be hard to close. I mean, there are some reserves in the central bank. Uh, there is 25 billion of, of reserves, which is kind of reassuring in this context. But it's also true that 
you have all these uh, payment needs. It's kind of a pity to be spending the money from the reserves on repayment uh, if you can do something better. The opportunity cost, in other words, of the repayment is very large. And also, it's going to get harder and harder because we're going to see these big jumps in yields and we're going to see this uh, uh, drop in the, in the currency as well. So, um, what, uh, sorry, I was going to say about external debt, what share of the debt is external. You know, there was a big restructuring. Let me show you, that's the exchange rate, sorry, that I mentioned before. This is the restructuring of the debt of Ukraine. And there was an agreement with all the creditors. There were a few institutional investors that were the main creditors. And these are all bonds. The reason I'm putting them here is because they are bonds that are pretty easy to restructure. They are bonds that have a collective action clause, like footnotes, okay, parentheses. Um, a collective action clause is a mechanism that allows a certain share of creditors to impose a restructure. So normally in the past, pre-2004, if you guys all lend money to me, I'm a country, okay? You all lend money to me. And I say, oh, I can't pay. I need the agreement of all of you to restructure, okay? The problem with that agreement is that there is one person there who's a vulture fund who bought 10 billion and he or 10 million or whatever, I mean, depends on the size of the country, sits on the chair and says, sorry, I'm not interested. And they want to be made whole. So they can block, okay? Now, this has the most modern and the most uh, perfect collective action clauses known to mankind, okay? Very flexible. 75% of the creditors can agree on a restructuring and 50% of a particular issue. So it's pretty, it's pretty reasonable. It's very hard for one of these funds to stop it. And also, by the way, which fund is going to take the wrath of the world uh, stopping a restructuring? Now, I'm not talking about a restructuring which you stop paying. I'm not talking about a restructuring where you say we're going to be um, forcefully reducing the nominal payment. No. I'm talking about a restructuring where um, and I'll, I, will, I will give details in a second, where you postpone the payment of the debt for a few years, you stop paying interest, etc. We'll see in a second with some details. Okay, so what are the things that are on the table that we can do? There are five. Three are straightforward. I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't know. Well, maybe a little bit in two, but four and five are unusual and a bit potentially uh, more interesting. One is increased financial support. So it's like, okay, we don't have enough aid for Ukraine. We need to give more, okay? There is liquidity. I mean, we have immediate needs of 50 billion and we say we got 24 billion uh, coming and it's also going to other things, like weapons and so on. Um, second, what I was starting to hint when I showed you the collective action clauses and the debt issuance. That was around... This one was uh, 1.2, 1.23. And, and okay, there is this one, which is very interesting. This is a GDP linked security. This is like a share, okay? You only pay when your GDP grows sufficiently, but it has to be over 125 billion. So I think that's probably not going to be a problem for a while. It gets restructured on its own. Um, it's not great because it's about growth. It's not about levels. So it has something weird. Let me just tell you quickly. If you wanted to link something to my income, I would like it to be, if I earn 110 and 120, if one year I earn 50 instead of 100, but then my growth is 10%, that's not necessarily good news because I'm really low. The way that the Ukrainian GDP linked bonds work is that they um, just matters how much you grow this year. If you grow more than three and a half, more than 4%, et cetera, with one little thing which is you have to have GDP over 125 billion. And I think that's not going to be the case. So all of those can be restructured relatively easier. How could we do it? So my, my point here is not to go to the creators and become a pariah and, and, and be in all sorts of trouble. My point is that you can easily extend maturities of all this. So it's a bond exchange where you say, guys, I need a few more years. 
I'm going to stop paying interest until the war is over and I want some fresh cash. So maybe two or three billion extra cash um, and a bond exchange with maybe new liquidity provision from the IMF, I think is perfectly feasible. Is this huge? It's not going to be huge, but it's going to be interesting, as well as the diaspora bonds that the government is already considering with all your, you have the lack of having all of this um, community uh, abroad. So there is a presence which has happened in COVID. Basically, during the COVID pan pandemic, there was a, a, a debt saving suspension initiative that could help uh, Ukraine right now save quite a few billion euros this year. Um, so this was Ecuador, just to show you one case. Ecuador had a 10 billion liquidity relief for five years, drop in average interest rate, average um, time duration, and debt service drop with this kind of restructuring because of an oil shock. So it can be done. Um, third, we can introduce additional loan guarantees, and I will tell you one particular way to do it through SDRs. Um, this is insufficient, but we need to step up, okay? So one thing you could do is you could say, okay, so Ukraine can issue debt backed up the European Union, and this debt only gets paid when Ukraine joins the European Union, something like that, that gives an incentive to Europe to really hurry up because they want this debt to be repaid. That would be one way to do it. Now, two strange ideas um, or more unusual ideas. One is the SDR allocation. So during the pandemic, the IMF gave a 650 billion allocation of SDRs. So somebody like France has 72 special drawing rights. This is like central banking currency, it's like gold. Think that they gave gold to everybody. You're supposed to put it in your bank account. Um, so basically, um, the countries have this money and they wanted to use it for development when they noticed they didn't need it. And the ECB said, no, you can't use this money. Impossible. And the ECB, I have the statement from the ECB here and says, the claims remain liquid and you cannot just use them for anything. Um, you cannot use them to develop uh, multilateral development banks. I think the ECB would have to change its mind, okay? So if Europe uses SDRs to guarantee, for example, uh, debt from Ukraine to issue debt uh, that is actually backed by the SDRs, or even to give it to Ukraine, the form of grants and loans, I think the ECB would have to accept it because that's a political decision and that's the end of the story. Finally, so the EU has had a very successful issuance of bonds, um, which were related to the pandemic, the Recovery and Reconstruction Fund. So um, we came together and we issued debt into the market that we could convert into uh, loans and grants from the different member states. The reason we could do that was because of an emergency. Well, now there is an emergency. And I think we can only also do that um, if Ukraine needs 50 billion, the UK, the European Union could take care of half of that, half of the issuance, and again, make sure that it's only uh, repaid when Europe is, uh, when, when, um, when Ukraine is, is, is in the European Union or it's growing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we could even issue it as perpetual bonds. You know that the perpetual bonds have been something that have been used by countries like the UK to fund the Napoleonic Wars. There is a tradition of this. We could potentially do that uh, and, and further reduce the cost to Europe. So I gave you two basic ideas. Um, I think that you guys are fighting for the freedom of all of us. Um, I think that we need, Europe needs to change the sanction discussion to start doing something. And I think a tariff on gas would be a good idea from an economics perspective. And I think we need to be creative and find the ways that Europe can channel money to Ukraine. And I think one way to do it is we could use perpetual debt, but we could, on top of that, use the recovery and reconstruction fund to get this money um, uh, guaranteed by the whole European Union, like we have been doing with the recovery money. So those are my two main points. I hope I didn't cover too much or get too, uh, too much. No, it's, it's actually exactly the time. So um, thanks very much. So I'm happy to take as many questions as you have. And also, not just questions, but much more interesting than questions, suggestions, because many of you 
know, obviously, the Ukrainian economy a million times better than me, and many of you uh, have been working on uh, sanctions, finance, etc. And the hope would be that I can also learn stuff that I can bring back to the parliament, etc. So please feel free to offer suggestions, criticism, say something, well, I don't like it, starting with you, Timo. Luis, you know, there is an air raid siren just a minute ago started when you were doing the slide air number. Yeah, so we probably have to kind of, yeah, keep well, if there formally. Well, there is, there is, we have to go. So, but we can discuss questions in shelter. Okay, let's discuss questions in shelter. All right, so All right. My, my apologies to people. We'll try to connect through Zoom this in a couple of minutes. Um, actually, maybe it's on someone's device, but we'll see if we can do it. This floor definitely. Yeah, it's a little bit, you know. So we, we and we promised uh, to everyone that we will be, okay. we will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. You. Yeah, we might do Q and A online or something. Yeah, but for now we're gonna wrap it up and uh, go to the shelter. Thank you very much. <laughs> have been waiting yeah the russians have been waiting for the end of the speech until so they shut it down afterwards uh hello everyone so uh we are in the shelter so this is the audience the speaker is outside we need a couple more minutes our speaker is um he's given an interview to a ukrainian media channel once he's finished with the interview, he'll be back here and he'll continue the lecture and Q&A session. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll wait for a couple more minutes. Thank you for staying with us.
Okay, I'll try to entertain people. I will introduce our team. This is Anna. She is in charge for all communication. So, uh, I'm Timothy Brink, by the way. I work here as a sociologist. Uh, yep. Natalia, Natalia Shapoval is the head of policy department here. It's a pretty decent, <laughs> pretty decent uh, shelter. <laughs> we have a student of one of our master programs here, uh, waiting for the lecture to resume. Uh, some leadership, and our school is here as well. So, um, yeah, I hope you keep in tight. Just give us five more minutes and we'll resume.
So no mobs are falling into here, no? <laughs> no, but we need to obey to these rules. Okay, so we will resume. Uh, I have the camera. I will be okay. your operator. Okay. Uh, the camera guy. Oh, you want me to start? So, um, okay, so when I, we have left it, we have left it as a QA. Thank you. Did you continue? Yeah. Okay, so we have left it as a QA. And what I had said is um, I'm really delighted that the people I have here are very knowledgeable about the two parts of the, of the issues that I, I, I talked about, which are sanctions and, and fiscal situation. So on those things, questions, but not just questions, but comments, thoughts, disagreements, ideas are very well. So who wants to start? I have one, I have two, I have three, I have four, I have a, you're the moderator, so I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Likewise. Okay, now show her. Yeah, maybe you can walk to her. Excuse me? a little bit about this scenario that uh, Russia could start pretending that they stop the war <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the European Union will cancel part of the sanction or all of the sanction. What is the possibility of this act from your point of view? So, um, so the question, just because we had a little problem with the camera, the question was, imagine that Putin says tomorrow, oh, we're stopping, we're happy with Donbass, Crimea, etc. and we just want the sanctions to go off. What's the risk that Europe says, okay, fine, now we're happy, we go back to the status quo ante. I think things are never going to go back to the start. I think that there is a clear conscious that what we have consciousness that what we have done over all these years, kind of getting too cozy with, uh, with uh, Putin has been really, you know, people say, oh, you have to be realistic. And that's not realistic. I mean, when people tell you that you have to be realistic, Cynical people are all usually wrong. Okay, you, it's the opposite. You have to have strong principles and act clearly, and that's the economically right thing to do. Very most of the time, in this case, so I would say it's not going to go to the start. But you're right. The temptation of the U.S. and Europe to say, Putin says, "Okay, I'm going to stop. You just need to remove the sanctions." The temptation to say, um, "Fine," is going to be strong. I think we should oppose it. And I think the way we need to do it, and we haven't done this, is to have a set of conditions for lifting the sanctions, which are explicit. And I think the conditions should include uh, the uh, end of the occupation of any parts of Ukraine. And the, the difficulty, of course, is that if he stops the violence and he continues the occupation, we go into this kind of difficult situation where there are two lines in Donbass and he's throwing bombs and, and Europe is like, okay, this is kind of this situation post 2015 right yes. is, and and that's no a very bad situation yeah no, that it's unacceptable I, I don't think we can accept that but I, you're right that that's a risk and you're right that we need to do everything possible to avoid it good question okay so clockwise there was another okay so you um, go 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 no we will just we'll re reiterate your question. Oh, why do you move it like this? I think it's cool to see them. <laughs> Hello. Maybe you switch yeah, the so, camera. So, you said, uh, like, uh, instead of embargo, uh, we should do yeah. tariffs because uh, tariffs could, could uh, allow for gradual. Not expect. I want them. Okay. I am, uh, I've written all the time. I've written a resolution fund. I was my writer. I've written the political. I've written everywhere. A Timo can, can say, Timothy can say about what I've done. Yeah. Uh, I, I am the hardest person for embargo. All I'm saying is maybe we need to start somewhere yeah, on gas. So I think on oil, it's going to happen anyway. But on gas, we need to start somewhere. So that's the question. Like, what is key with WIC, right? Some banks were sanctioned, some not. It doesn't really work. It doesn't do anything. Yes. Because, so, yeah. because the, the financial system is like a river, right? It just wants to go down. If I say I'm going to dump two thirds of the river, that's like okay, all the water goes around the one third. Doesn't do anything. The money wants to go from somebody who wants to pay for gas to somebody who sells gas. He's going to find a way to pay. Goes the bank says no, this bank doesn't take it. Okay, goes her bank. Hey, your bank takes it. Yeah, sure. So I go. So that's the do is, what might be if if we start with tariffs, that would alleviate the political pressure. Saying yeah, with tariffs, well, why why go for for the bank? And, and that's it. So how how do you... This is a great point, right? It's always when you do an incremental thing, the risk is that that's enough mm -hmm. to 
to say, well, then we don't need to do any more things. Uh, so that's a, that's a great point. I think the only way the tariffs will make sense is if they are the start of a ratcheting in that. Now we can say, look, this is the tariff today, and in two months it's going to be this, and in three months it's going to be this, and those four months it's going to be that. You are going to need that because otherwise you're right. It's like, no, 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 we're only charging 20% more for the Russian gas. It's like, well, that's that's really not what we are looking for. So this this is I have not been advocating tariffs until today, until these days. Uh, today in the Economist, there's an article where they interviewed me and I explained them this tariff idea and so on. And um this has been the reason, right? That if you give an easy solution, then people will take it or an easy air. But I fear that the alternative in, in gas is going to be taking too long. I had one here and uh, then one here. Okay. So uh, there is all the evidence already that oil embargo is possible. So even German sick tanks, European sick tanks, everyone wrote that yeah. it's possible to yeah. do with all the level of detail. Yeah. And European Parliament uh, has evidence. Asteroid. Yes. So like, why? Why it's not happening? And there are so many countries that don't import like thirty percent; they import ten percent from Russia. Yeah. Why it's not uh, happening for that long? Like, what, what should be done differently? I think that um, some. Uh, I mean, there's some. Countries where uh, the, the the politicians have gotten into this story that it's going to be catastrophic, and now they they are not willing to go back. Um, I don't have a good explanation. I think that Europe should do it, and I think you're going to see it. Like all West of August, I think you're going to see that oil. The pressure is so strong that they're going to have to announce oil for November or something. You know, I think you're going to see it. But you're right. It is doable, and it's a crime that we're not doing. So I I, I hope that we do it uh, in the next package of sanctions. We should do oil and gas. That's what the parliament says. Okay, so thank All you. right. Thank you for the stuff to the numbers presentation. It's great ideas there. And thank you very much for coming in here. It's quite great here. And thanks for having this. Uh, Q&A uh, session in, in Shalta. Is it your first time in Shalta? It's my first time in Shalta. It's going to be memorable for the rest of my life. And However long it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question basically is, uh, what do you think, what's your perception on whether people across the Europe, I mean, average consumers, whether they are ready to pay additional costs for whatever it takes to put on the embargo for uh, There are two things which are additional cost and whatever it takes. That's the whole conclusion, right? <laughs> I mean, whatever it takes, I, I think that it's very interesting, right? When you ask the public opinions, including in Germany, the public's opinions are very strong. They want the oil and gas embargo. People feel really bad about this and they really want to do it. The politicians don't trust them. The politicians think, yeah, yeah, you say this, but when you start to see your gas bill or your oil bill go up, you're going to vote somebody else. You know what I mean? Like public opinion really is strong with Ukraine in every country. Um, the politicians are just distrustful of how strong that commitment is. So I think that um, it's a question of, of finding that path that, that allows us to carry the public opinion without changing, right? Because the public opinion now will support all of this. So one very clear um, proof that where the public opinion is, is how the parliament voted on the sanctions when we voted last week. So I was the, the main rapporteur for this. I wrote the resolution. So I was negotiating with all the other groups, et cetera. And there was an amendment that said immediate class amendment. The amendment passed and the resolution with that amendment overwhelmingly passed. Nobody dared to vote against. Why don't they dare to vote against? Because they know their voters are asking for it. So the voters are there. It's just that we need to get the politicians to believe their voters. It's a bit strange, but that's how, that's how it is. Is it relative to the countries of the EU, by the way, like that the voters are there? or you I would that say that the three countries that we have seen more, more reluctant are, are Germany, Austria, and Hungary. They are about three. Right? I think I mean, France has a presidential election on Sunday, right? So that makes the debate more complicated. Uh, but I, I do think that France is, is 
going to be leading. Bruno Le Maire, in, 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 even in an electoral campaign, the finance minister this week said it's completely for enemy oil embargo. So that proves that I think France is, is really going to be willing to, to lead. I think you will see an oil embargo pretty fast. And I also see thing that if you look at the debate in Germany, that has been so costly for the for the SPD because everybody's looking at them like thinking in nationally, internationally. Uh, I think the pressure is building for more weapons we haven't talked about because that's not my part. Um, and also for stronger sanctions. Yes. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to tell how much we are thankful for support of Spain, of, uh, for me, because I'm a little bit aware of how Spanish internal policy is, make, is made. So for me, uh, the socialists, Pedro Sanchez, and they are supporting Ukraine, I'm quite sorprendido uh -huh. for the level, and I'm quite sorprendido because of his visit today in Ukraine. Can you just explain us, am I right to be sorprendido or not? Because for, for social government, it's not so regular. To be expected. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think that the, the government's position on this, indeed, uh, a bit divided. There is a coalition between the socialists and the communists, so they have some really really like not to be trusted with any of these things. But the socialist government is pretty solid. Um, it has a good minister of defense, and he has a certain a strong uh, position on this. And I think that uh, on 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 helping, and I think I agree with you that it's very good that Pedro Sanchez was here today. Uh, maybe heard I was coming, so he had to come to work. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, but I think I think that that uh, uh, the Socialist Party has a tradition that is more Atlanticist, maybe than than you would imagine. They were in favor of the exit from NATO until '82, but in '82 they called a referendum to remain in NATO, and they and they, they went in. So uh, it's a complicated government, but this the, the moderate pro-European parties right now in control, and that's good. Thank you. No, no, you're not. Ah, you, yes. <laughs> I have two, two, two issues. Um, uh, first, the uh, Ukrainian government uh, sent to European Union, US, and Great Britain, and other uh, countries uh, more than uh, 5,000 of persons who are responsible for this aggression, uh, including uh, all military high-level officials, uh, including the heads of the republics of Russia who helped Putin to take this invasion, because we uh, know that uh, a lot of people from national republics of Russia uh, killed Ukrainians here uh, near the Kiev. And, um, uh, but today we have only 103 uh, uh, 1,300 1, uh, people in all sanction uh, lists of all countries. Uh, so my uh, question is how can we have a fast track of this process? Because we already have a list of the people who are responsible with justification for the sanctioning. Uh, how can we have a fast track for this process? And uh, uh, who are the decision makers we need to address it? So, um, the, uh, the sanctions policy is so just to give you a 30 seconds course in European decision making there are laws in which we have the competences uh, the parliament and the governments the council and the, and the and the parliament the co-legislators so when we do a law on the market on internal market on the telephones on the pay on the whatever thing has to do with the environment with agriculture we do it together and decisions have to do with foreign policy we as legislators have nothing to say. The sanctions are put by the council, by the governments. It's a council decision that gets passed and goes straight. We don't vote. All we do is make noise and ask, okay? We are going to make noise and ask. We're going to have next week uh, with Kiefer Hofstadt, we're gonna have an yeah. event to- He said six. 6,000. Oh, 
we're going to have an event to push for the 6,000 list. We're going to have a, we're going to aim to have a resolution uh, for the 6,000 list. And we believe, like you believe, that all of these intermediate people are very important because you know the oligarchs always have options. But the guy who is like the governor, or the mayor, or something, and he has a villa in Spain or in you know these people don't have like 20 villas. They have a villa, you know, and if they can't use it. That's that hurts. So I think it's really important to target this set of people and. From Parliament, you'll hear us a lot in the next few weeks. We're going to do a lot of noise with, with that 6,000 list or 5,000 more. Okay. Um, um, today, uh, Ukraine, uh, Parliament, uh, Ukrainian Parliament voted the law that allows uh, to confiscate the uh, Russian uh, assets in Ukraine, the so, uh, so, sovereign assets and the assets of people who are responsible for the aggression in the administrative uh, procedure. Uh, for example, not, uh, criminal, not, criminal, not criminal, criminal, like civil confiscation in, in uh, corruption cases. Yeah. Uh, before this day, uh, just one country have, uh, uh, have the procedure like this, the US from 1977. And they uh, used it. Yes, and uh, I want to ask you to raise this question uh, uh, in European Parliament, in uh, European countries. And um, we uh, drafted this law in um, uh, with the uh, 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 in the uh, line of the European Convention uh, of Human Rights. And do you have a version yeah. in English? I would love to see that law. I would love to see that law. So first of all, I promise to look it up and to take it serious. There was a sixth point in that presentation of ways to get money, which was the 350 billion euros in confiscated in uh, seized, frozen reserves of the Russian Central Bank. We have that money there. Mm -hmm. um, we could say, look, the longer the war is going to last, the worse for you, because we're going to be paying for the Ukraine uh, effort from that money. Um, when I talk to lawyers about it, they uh, go up in arms. I mean, they say, Look, in order to seize money, you can use the procedure which is uh, administrative uh, to freeze money, but in order to confiscate it, you have to have a criminal law uh, court that says that this particular person was involved with this particular decision. And once a link is established, you can assign responsibility, but you cannot take her assets without proving that she was herself or he was herself. Herself. So if you have a solution that you think is yeah. within the convention, then we definitely want What's the solution? How does that work? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's the same procedure uh, that uh, is in the Convention Against Corruption. When you confiscate uh, assets in a civil case yeah. uh, without uh, any uh, criminal offense. Yeah. It's the same procedure, like like in this convention. Okay, I, 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 I know it because I'm, I uh, work uh, for 17 years as a prosecutor, and uh, yeah. now I'm the head of the agents on uh, corruption prevention. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a procedure that uh, I think uh, uh, is in uh, uh, Spain legislation. Too. Yeah, in Spain legislation, but, but there's, but a not, there's a procedure to seize the money for drugs, for example, or for corruption, and you put it in some um, you know, <laughs> police depot, and it stays it's there. The but but I don't know if you can actually confiscate it. I mean, yes, yes yeah, with, you, you can. Confiscate it without criminal, yes, a criminal without decision criminal. that this person was involved. Okay, yeah. we will look at this. I mean, it, it's very, very important. It's a complicated legal process. I've looked at it three times since the war started. I actually had a conference call with seven or eight experts and they were all like, oh, you can do that, you can do that. Basically, they say it's going to be more trolling it's worth because you're going to have uh, legal cases and that, and at the end, you're going to take forever. So. But I think that would be great. You have 350 billion, you need 50 hops. There is the first 50 done, right? Uh, that would be the easiest way to do it. But I, I'm not sure if legally that's the case. Well, I'll ask the question. Yes. Hello. Yes. Like these 350, for what? Uh, just, just these 350. Uh, so, in order to get to them, let's assume that some legislative change is going to happen. Talk about the EU Parliament, but again, this is more like implementative measures going to be. So, which uh, legislation of what countries do you think should be amended in this case? So, so the parliamentary then decision yeah, should no, be it's taken. A, it's a, I think it's not going to be a European. I don't think it's going to be European legislation. It's going to be a, a specific, specific national laws in each particular country, which will be different, right? That's the thing. Well, my question about. The, public, uh, the Russian attempts to influence public sentiments in the European Union. 
Uh, so currently we see that uh, Russian government uh, trying to message that uh, next sanctions will affect, first of all, European citizens and uh, creating the narrative that uh, uh, supporting Ukraine, it is very high price for Europeans. So what do you think? Is Europe ready to deal with it? And uh, is this risk going to really you know, lead to some weakening of sanction in the future? No, I think both, both questions are, are related to things we discussed. Uh, on the weakening of sanctions in the future, yes, we know public opinions have uh, short memories and, and well taken and your point well taken that if people can't stop seeing people dying in the streets they are going to want everything to go back prices to go down etc europe is going to diversify its energy for sure i mean now this is an extra impulse we have the mid climate now we have putin i mean people are going to go to renewals etc so i mean russia will probably never have as much power as they had four or five months ever again uh, four, four months ago but on the second, on the, the first part of the, of, the, of the question, which we discussed with the polling, et cetera, I think the polling shows that people really do have, really do support this everywhere in Europe. So, uh, and every parliamentarian in the, the European Parliament voted, or almost every parliamentarian voted for this. So, my sense is that we can do this, and that uh, it's just a question of moving some political systems that are kind of uh, stuck in, in not trusting the votes. But I think, I think. The majorities are solid, really. So now the little growing prices. Growing prices will be the price. Inflation. Yeah, growing prices will be the price. But I mean, as I saw, uh, the, the work that uh, Simon said, so you know very well, shows that um, the likely uh, impact in terms of uh, uh, GDP is probably two or three percent rather than catastrophic, and two or three percent European countries should be able to deal with. Spain dealt with like ten points during the pandemic, and you know, if it was this, if you wanted, if you're a country, you want to borrow three percent GDP and not have any second round effect, how much do you have to borrow? Three percent. You borrow three percent in the markets, you keep people who lost three percent of GDP, you're done. And growing your debt from 60 to 63 or from 100 to 123 is easy. The problem is to have permanently higher pensions or something that grow your debt every year, but one of three, four percent points is not a problem. So if you have a war, you have to issue that debt, you issue it and you're done. If you have a gas hike, you can do it. You can compensate the losers. That's the big trick in economics that we we'll discuss how we will compensate the losers, how we avoid the winners getting even more wins. But you can you can do it, you have enough cash for that. Do we have any of the zoomers asking us? Well, there are two questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello. So I'll be talking on behalf of the Zoom audience, and there were two questions, and both of them they are... did stay. They, our Zoomers did stay uh, uh, to the to the bomb. Uh, there are at least sixteen. Okay. Uh, good. Good. Zoomers who are not us. I know that there are also. Well, okay. I don't count myself. Okay. So there were two questions, and they all uh, they both are political. So basically, one person wants to ask your opinion. Um, give me a second. It's about Germany. Yeah, people really want to know uh, your opinion about the political capital. So the question is, uh, can you comment on the difficulty to build the political capital for leaders to take such decisions, uh, you know, about sanctions and everything? Um, and what's going on with Schultz and uh, his political capital? Yeah, it's very political decision about political capital. Yeah, <laughs> a political discussion. Um, uh, so we are part of the governing coalition. There is a liberal party in Germany, the FDP, which is the sister party of the party I am in, in Parliament, with, which is Renew Europe. Um, and I think that there are forces in the coalition that are pushing for more action, both the liberals and the Greens. Um, and the socialists have had a very strong reaction always to Russia, they always think that it's dangerous to, or that they want to atone for the war. They don't, they thought they fought with Russia, so Germany should be friends of Russia now. So it's very difficult for them to change that view suddenly. They did a big change when they said they were going to spend more money in defense, but they haven't done the whole change. So um, I hope, I hope the Social Democratic Party of Germany changes. They, 
CDU is good, the Popular Party, Liberals and Greens are also in the right direction. So I hope the Chancellor, uh, you know, they seem to always react late, but they always end up reacting. That's my, that's my take. Okay, um, second please. Uh, there were, one second. There were some other questions, but I think you actually covered them okay. because there were questions about what, sanctions and everything and whatever, everything we just discussed. Uh, I also know that you have a quite packed train schedule. To train you, to catch, you need to, a train to catch. And to have a, yeah. And, a and to rest meetings. and yeah. to have yeah. some meetings. So it's very good to be here. And uh, I, I, um, I am really impressed by what you guys doing. And I'm happy that we did it in person, even if it was kind of uh, not fully, fully at uh, the end uh, the way we expected. But thanks to the people following online. Thanks to all of you. Well, and, I will uh, show everyone. Okay, so let's take a picture. Um, uh, let's, so, uh, let's take a screenshot. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this online event. Nobody took a screenshot uh, of your screen. Ah, okay, we have a photo there. Uh, so thank you. Okay, okay, we're doing selfies. Okay. okay. Um, I want to thank that you. photo uh, because it's 